Next on Lectures in History, University of Nebraska-Lincoln professor William Thomas teaches a class on some of the lawsuits brought by slaves who sued for their freedom during the antebellum period. He outlines the different legal arguments they used and emphasizes how most suits affected not just one person, but entire families. Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's, uh, let's get started. So today, our subject is freedom suits, suits brought by enslaved families and how they posed a challenge to the Constitution and uh, under the Constitution, how they posed a challenge to American slavery. Now, most of us are familiar with Dred Scott v. John Sanford, and you all read Chief Justice Roger Tawney's majority opinion in, in Dred Scott's case. And you've, you've read that opinion, and it's, uh, it's notorious in American history, right, for the blatant racism in it, for the the sanction that Tawney gives to the concept of human property under the Constitution, and for denying black citizenship. Um, not only denying black citizenship, but denying even blacks as free as persons under the Constitution. And so Dred Scott was one type of freedom suit, right? It was based on his physical presence in a free state, Illinois, and his physical presence in Wisconsin, a free territory. And it's often presented in American history textbooks as if it were the only freedom suit in American history to go to the Supreme Court, the only almost un uniformly presented just as Dred Scott. It's one man bringing a freedom suit. But when we look into it a little more closely, there were thousands of freedom suits in American courts, all of them challenging the notion of slavery under the Constitution. What we're looking at here is a long line of anti-slavery constitutionalism. That's our subject for today. What, was this, what were these freedom suits about? What did they do? And how did they challenge the concept of slavery under the Constitution? It's important to recognize that these suits came, were, were beginning from day one of the United States uh, in 1787, 1788. In fact, even before in the colonial period as well, and certainly in the 1780s during the Articles of Confederation, these suits were coming forward in various states, Maryland and Virginia in particular. Now, Dred Scott's argument, right, was that he had been on free soil and therefore was free. And it's important also to recognize that that, had been, that argument had been reprised in previous freedom suits in various state courts, including Missouri in the 1820s, where in particular one case, Winnie v. Whitesides, laid down the concept of once free, always free. Once having gone to a free territory, an enslaved person having re been returned to a slave state like Missouri was, in Missouri's law, uh, forever free. Many of these freedom suits took on some of the uh, most high-profile uh, high people of the day. And you can see here Charlotte Depew's uh, lawsuit in 1830 against Henry Clay. Henry Clay, the Secretary of State at the time, outgoing Secretary of State, he had been Speaker of the House. He was one of the most well-known politicians in American history. He was a perennial uh, candidate, possibility for the presidency. Depew sued Henry Clay. Hundreds of lawsuits in Washington, D.C. There were hundreds in St. Louis, Missouri. There were lawsuits in New Orleans, there were lawsuits in Baltimore. There were lawsuits in various parts of Maryland and Virginia. So there were thousands of these lawsuits. And some of the same concepts that we see in Dred Scott, and we're going to talk about in just a minute, come up in some of the earlier cases. Notably, one case you all have looked into, uh, Mai McQueen, her lawsuit against, uh, uh, against, uh, against John Hepburn, 
What, what were the central elements of that Queen v. Hepburn case in 1813? Anybody? Yeah. The thought was uh, since her grandmother or great-grandmother was free, that she was then free, but uh, they overruled most of the testimonies that she presented because it was hearsay. Right. Okay, good. Excellent. So this, this Queen case was based on the claim that she made that her ancestor had been taken to England and resided there on free soil for three years before uh, coming to the Maryland colony. And instead of being sold as an indentured servant for seven years, she was effectively enslaved upon her arrival in the Maryland colony. And she had been from, this ancestor had been from New Spain, right? Uh, Ecuador, present day Ecuador today. So she was perhaps African, perhaps uh, indigenous Native American from that area, right, of South America, and had been taken to London, resided there. But, um, and so, despite that, Chief Justice John Marshall, in the 1813 decision, he affirms this hearsay rule. And it, it's designed to keep out oral testimony, right, about the ancestors of enslaved people. And so her free status, all of the evidence for her free status, her ancestors' free status, <coughs> came from depositions in which people said, my mother said, or I heard about this, or it was secondhand testimony. And Marshall's decision had rendered that testimony inadmissible, and in all future cases as well. And Marshall's decision was designed to protect property rights, right? In fact, Marshall invokes the idea of property and defending property rights in that 1813 decision. Now, in Queen v. Hepburn also, there's an important dissent that we need to uh, hold in our mind and, and remember. And one of the associate justices, Gabriel Duval, he writes a dissent in that case in which he strongly implies that enslaved people are not property under the law. And in particular, in cases where a person's freedom was on the line, the court should allow any and all evidence, even if it's hearsay, it should allow it in. Because when a person's freedom is on the line, the court should lean in favor of freedom, in favor of liberty. Now, Duval, as it happens, had pioneered many of the freedom suits in Maryland. And Duval knew about all of the Maryland cases in which hearsay had been admitted, right? Maryland, under its uh, law, had allowed hearsay testimony. But when the Supreme Court in Queen v. Hepburn ruled in 1813 that hearsay was inadmissible, that, in a way, doesn't it? shuts down a certain line of freedom suit. Claiming uh, freedom on the basis of an ancestor became so much more difficult to prove if you couldn't use the kinds of depositions that, or the kinds of testimony, oral testimony, um, family lore, in, in, in lieu of written documents, right? And so my McQueen did not win her suit in 1813, but as we're going to see, hundreds of other enslaved families, enslaved people did win their freedom suits. Dred Scott did not win his, but hundreds of others did. And so if, if we, com if we com compare, just for a minute, this, what are the similarities between Queen v. Hepburn and uh, Dred Scott v. John Sanford? What are some of the similarities? Well. The first, y'all have mentioned it, is that Dred Scott's claim, in a way, was, was similar, sort of like Queen's, right? He was saying he was free because he had set foot on free soil where slavery was illegal in Illinois. And under Illinois law, setting foot on in Illinois, that was, uh, that, that was immediately emancipatory, Okay. He was also free because he had been taken to Wisconsin Territory where slavery was barred under the Missouri Compromise above the 3630 line. 
But I want to draw your attention specifically to another similarity between Dred Scott's case and Queen v. Hepburn, okay? And in my view, this is the most important similarity between them. And in really, it characterizes all of the freedom suits we're going to talk about, and in particular, the case that we're going to look at today. And that is this. Both were family-based freedom suits, okay? I said that we often think of Dred Scott's case as one man, Dred Scott, but Harriet Scott, Dred Scott's spouse, filed her freedom suit at exactly the same time. She had been taken to Fort Snelling in Wisconsin Territory, and she had been sold or transferred to Dr. Emerson, who enslaved Dred Scott. Think about that for a second. She was sold, effectively, in a free territory. So if slavery is not legal under American law in the territory of Wisconsin, how is it that Harriet Scott could be sold there? Not just taken there, but sold, right? Their daughter, Eliza, was born on a steamer up the Mississippi River above the 3630 line, okay? Their other daughter, Lizzie, was born in Missouri upon their return. So Dred Scott v. v. John Sanford is not just about Dred Scott. It's about Harriet and Dred and Eliza and Lizzie. It's about a family who in various ways have different claims to freedom, right? I mean, Eliza is born in a free territory, and Lizzie is born upon return to parents who've been effectively under law, presumably possibly freed, in in their residence uh, in the free territory. So first and foremost, I just want to make this clear. This is, um, the Dred Scott case is a family freedom suit, and uh, like Queen v. Hepburn, and many of the others that that uh, came forward in Washington, D.C. The other introductory point here is that all of these freedom suits aim toward limiting slavery's uh, reach, right? You think about all the freedom suits are about defining slavery as, as circumscribed by something. It can exist in a certain state, but not others. It can exist only by law in this way. Um, If there are wills or contracts, as we're going to see in a minute, then slavery is void in those cases. In other words, almost every freedom suit, if we step back and look from 30,000 feet at what's happening, all of these freedom suits are defining slavery as something local. Freedom is national, the norm. Slavery is local. Freedom is national, slavery is circumscribed, it's defined, it's tightly defined. It can only go so far as the law in its particular places. And so these freedom suits, again, today's point is, are the longest line of anti-slavery constitutionalism. That is the idea that the Constitution did not confer legitimacy on slavery. So about these suits, generally, just broadly. And then we're going to look at one in particular here. It's important to recognize everything was on the line here. Black plaintiffs directed these suits. Okay. Black plaintiffs planned these suits. These were determined legal actions. African Americans had accumulated years of legal knowledge, legal know-how, experience, sophisticated strategies of negotiation and working through the law. They passed these ideas down from generation to generation. This is another theme we're going to see today. Lots of these cases are multi-generational. Grandparent, 
Next generation, next generation. The second is something we've talked about in this class uh, before, and that is that the freedom suits were civil actions, right? Um, what does that mean? They're civil actions. Uh, what's the, uh, can, can, the, um, can the defendant slaveholder testify? No, no right? The, they can't. So in a civil action, in a civil suit, the defendant can't testify, the plaintiff, the enslaved plaintiff can't testify. But the point here is that defendants, slaveholders, have to rely on other witnesses. They cannot use their own authority, their own uh, um, sort of reputation to try to um, place themselves right before the court. In effect, the, the freedom suits put the slaveholders on the defensive, right? They fundamentally, slaveholders, had to defend slaveholding individually in these, in these suits. And the third broad point is this. A, a lot of the freedom suits, in particular the ones we're going to look at today, were, di were an effort to stop, to interrupt the potential breakup of a family. Okay? The separation of families is at the heart of many of these freedom suits. Because by filing a suit, the mechanism of the court would at least for the moment delay the impending sale and breakup of a, of a family. In fact, here's an example. Just this is, uh, uh, you all know that, that my team here at the University of Nebraska is producing a, uh, a documentary film about one of the Freedom Suits, in fact, the case we're going to look at today. Um, uh, and here's a, 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 just a storyboard that we've come up with that, that is about this. Gives us a sense of this. Let me through. Let me through. Wait, wait. Let me through. You're holding my Mary. She's free, free. See, here, signed. Right here is... Stand down. The train's leaving. Daniel Stand down. Mary. Freedom papers, signed. My wife, Mary. See, she, she Mary. She's free. She's Daniel. Daniel. Okay, at the heart of this story is a central fact that slaveholders throughout the entire period here, from 1800 to 1860, were separating families and selling people or attempting to sell them into the interstate slave trade with deception and with speed. This is what we might call sudden sales. Slaveholders used this tactic, a sudden sale, deceive the enslaved, not tell them what's happening, sell them quickly, transport them to Washington, D.C., out of Maryland, and then on the ships or, or marched or, uh, or, or on the train to the deep south, to Louisiana, to the sugar fields or to the cotton fields of Mississippi. These Sudden sales were quite obviously meant to, in some cases, avert possible freedom, to avert uh, what the law might dictate in a, in a particular family uh, that might have a legitimate claim to freedom, to place people suddenly out of the reach of the courts, rip them away from their family networks, remove them from the possibility of being able to contact an attorney much less gather witnesses for their case. How could one gather witnesses for a freedom suit having been sent to Louisiana uh, if they were uh, from Maryland? So today, we're going to concentrate on the story 
on the case of James Ash versus William H. Williams. This is a freedom suit prior to Dred Scott, okay, where Chief Justice Roger Taney also wrote the majority opinion. And I think it's important because this is a case where Taney creates a sort of legal fiction that he will later deploy in Dred Scott. Okay? Um, and I think you'll see what I mean by the end here. Only when we look at cases like James Ash v. William H. Williams and the long history of these freedom suits can we see that the challenge that they posed to slavery under the Constitution was such that Roger Taney was willing to go to great lengths to avoid, as he does in Dred Scott, to avoid recognizing black Americans as rights-bearing people under the Constitution, right? I mean, that is, that is what the Dred Scott case ultimately uh, does. This is the deep lie at the heart of the Dred Scott decision and one that we're going to expose today. So first, James Ash. He's part of a large family from Prince George's County, Maryland. He was enslaved, and many of the people in his family were enslaved, of course. He's a, uh, he's a brother-in-law of Daniel Bell and a brother-in-law of Ann Bell, both of whom are the children of Lucy Bell the matriarch of this family. She had already negotiated for her freedom. It appears that she was living as a free woman in Washington, D.C., had moved from Prince George's County to Washington, D.C., and was living as a free woman in the 1820s. Lucy Bell lives to the age of 99. Okay? She dies in the summer of 1862. just after Washington, D.C. emancipation is effected in the middle of the Civil War, right? The point is, in 1862, age 99, she saw the last of her children and grandchildren free. But the struggle for their freedom goes back to the 1830s. So think about this as a 30-year Three-generation, more than 30-year, three-generation struggle for freedom. Using the courts where possible, negotiating, navigating, accumulating legal knowledge, passing it on. In 1862, her children, Ann Bell, Daniel Bell, and Caroline Bell, bought a headstone for her, and she's buried at Congressional Cemetery with a headstone dedicated to their, their mother. William H. Williams was one of the most notorious slave traders in Washington, D.C. He owned the Yellow House. It was a slave jail and in the parlance of the day was sometimes called a slave pen, right? We've already looked at one case, Ann Williams's case, uh, the film we checked out the other, uh, the other day, and um, uh, that one was similar in that George Miller's tavern was a, a slave pen, right? We talked about that. William H. Williams is, by the 1830s, uh, the single largest slave jail in the city of Washington, and it's called the Yellow House. And uh, James Ash was taken there and held there, we'll see why in just a second, in 1839. And a few months later, a man named Solomon Northrop was taken to the Yellow House. And you, uh, you may know Solomon Northrop from 12 Years a Slave. He's the author of 12 Years a Slave. The movie uh, came out a couple of years ago. Uh, Academy Award winner uh, film. 
And Solomon Northrup, who was kidnapped and taken uh, to be sold uh, to Louisiana and, and to the Southwest, um, was taken to the Yellow House after he was kidnapped. And he wrote about it this way. This is, what, um, this is how Northrup described uh, the Yellow House. The room was about 12 feet square, the walls of solid masonry. The floor was of heavy plank. There was one small window crossed with great iron bars with an outside shutter securely fastened. The furniture of the room in which I was consisted of the wooden bench on which I sat, an old-fashioned dirty box stove, and besides these, in either cell, there was neither bed, nor blanket, nor anything whatever. The yard extended rearward from the house about 30 feet. In one part of the wall, there was a strongly ironed door opening into a narrow covered passage leading along one side of the house into the street. The doom of the colored man upon whom the door leading out of that narrow passage closed was sealed. The top of the wall supported one end of a roof which ascended inwards forming a kind of open shed. Underneath the roof The outside presented only the appearance of a quiet residence. A stranger looking at it would never have dreamed of its execrable uses. Strange as it may seem, within plain sight of this same house, looking down from its commanding height upon it was the Capitol. The voices of patriotic representatives boasting of freedom and equality and the rattling of the poor slave's chains almost commingled a slave pen within the very shadow of the Capitol. We can see that right, right here, right? We've got Capitol Square. Here's the Yellow House. We're going to talk about the bells where Ash is in just a second right here. Daniel Bell works at the Navy Yard. We'll talk about that in just a second over here. And uh, a white slaveholder uh, family that the Bells end up suing uh, or they are here at Ar Ar Armistead's residence. Okay, uh, the White House, President's House, there on the map is just down Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, how did? Where do we start with this story? Ash was seized in Prince George's County in 1839 in one of these what I would call sudden sales. Right, he was taken quickly and sent to the Yellow House. Williams planned to transport him and send him to Louisiana. When we pull back and look at the broad scope of this interstate slave trade, we're talking about between 1820 and 1860, a million and a half people sold out of Maryland and Virginia and Delaware and sent into the South, uh, Cotton South and the sugar fields. A million and a half people, 186,000 children, at least 260,000 spouses separated. Okay? One scholar has estimated that every 3.6 minutes between 1820 and 1860, a family was broken up and a person was sold. A person was sold every 3.6 minutes for 40 years. Okay. The scope and the scale of the interstate slave trade is something we have to reckon with and think about as Americans and understand this forced migration every 3.6 minutes for 40 years. Well, Ash was one who was taken, sold, sent to the Yellow House, and it's there that he has somehow the resources, probably because he was a member of the Bell family, and they are not far away. In 1839, he has the resources, the family networks, to bring a freedom suit, which he does in December of 1839. So to understand what happens, how Ash, like Northrop, ends up in the Yellow House, 
what set his freedom suit in motion to understand the story of Ash V. Williams. He's taking on the largest, most notorious slave trader in the city, right? This, to understand, we've got to step back. It's complicated because it involves everyone in the Bell family. James Ash claimed his freedom on the basis of the provisions in an 1824 will, the will of Maria Greenfield. She had no children of her own. Um, she be uh, she uh, bequeathed all of her property, including enslaved people, including James Ash, and including Anne Bell. She bequeathed all of them to her nephew, Gerard Greenfield, who had moved from Maryland to Tennessee. So he's in Tennessee in 1824. He has dozens of enslaved people working in cotton fields. He's a large planter slaveholder. But she bequeaths with the following proviso. I think you see it right here on the screen. It's the key to the whole case for Ash. Provided, quote, I'm going to quote this here so you, you can hear it. He shall not carry them, he, Gerard Greenfield, her nephew, he shall not carry them out of the state of Maryland or sell them to anyone, either of which events I will and devise the said Negroes to be free for life. Okay, so this will is unalterably clear, isn't it? And it's the last statement in the will. This is important, it turns out, in the court case. It's the last thing in the will. It's not the first thing in the will where there's lots of other confusing matters. It's the final summation, and she places this proviso. He shall not carry them out of the state of Maryland, i.e. to Tennessee, and he shall, she, he shall not sell them to anyone, whether in Maryland or elsewhere, right? Okay. But you're probably thinking, wait a minute, the will can't be the whole story here of the timing of this lawsuit. The will was in 1824. Ash is sold in 1839. So what happened? What happened in the intervening period? And why is Ash suddenly sold against the provisions of this, obvious provisions of this will? Well, first of all, we, sh we need to recognize, for years, Gerard T. Greenfield, the nephew, did nothing, right? He did nothing to violate the will. This will meant that Gerard T. Greenfield in Tennessee had to keep James Ash and Ann Bell, his sister-in-law, and others who fell under its provisions in Maryland. He could not sell them. And so in this situation, Ann Bell in particular, moved to Washington, D.C., lived on her own. She hired herself out. She effectively lived as a free woman in a free manner. James Ash was unable to do that. He was, uh, it appears, continuously enslaved on a plantation in Prince George's County, but probably hired out by uh, uh, Gerard, in, Gerard Greenfield in, in, in Tennessee, right? He's hired out James Ash to work, and he's taking all of the, uh, the, the proceeds, of course. Well, that's the situation. Until in the summer of 1835, 11 years after this will, There is a riot and a strike at the Navy Yard. There's chaos in the city of Washington. And in that moment, Daniel Bell, Anne's brother, 
James Ash's brother-in-law, Daniel Bell decides to begin a delicate negotiation for the freedom of his wife, Mary, and her six children. Now, Bell was an enslaved blacksmith at the Washington Navy Yard, so he worked here. Um, there were about 13 enslaved uh, uh, African Americans at the Navy Yard. There were some free blacks working at the Navy Yard. One of his uh, associates at the Navy Yard, uh, a black, free black man named Joseph Thompson, had won his freedom in court on, a, on the provisions of a will. He had filed a freedom suit. So Daniel Bell worked side by side with Joseph Thompson. We can be sure that they talked about these matters, right? But in the, in the Navy Yard, one of the foremen at the yard was a man named Robert Armstead. Right? He lives right here, close to the Navy Yard. And Robert Armstead was the slaveholder who held Mary and the six children. Okay? A white man, a foreman in the yard, not particularly wealthy. He, his principal wealth really was Mary and the six children, Mary Bell. And so Daniel, noticed, Daniel clearly knew that Robert Armstead, two things about Robert Armstead in the summer of 1835. He knew that Robert Armstead had signed a memorial for the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C. This was circulated in 1828. A thousand or more white men signed it. Ninety white men at the Navy Yard who worked there signed this petition, this memorial, which was sent to Congress saying slavery should be abolished in the District of Columbia. So, so Bell knew that Armstead had signed, had put his name down on that memorial. He also knew, by the way, that the three justices of the D.C. court had also signed that memorial. Everyone probably took note of that. But he knew one other thing, too, and that was that Robert Armstead was dying. He was sick. We don't know the cause. Increasingly, his health was failing. He'd left the Navy Yard. He couldn't work any longer. He was effectively in the almshouse. And Daniel Bell goes to Robert Armstead. And he asks him for a deed of manumission to free Mary and his six children. He does this in the late summer of 1835, Washington, D.C. is in the middle of, as I said, this labor strike, this riot. There's confusion. There's chaos. But Robert Armstead signs and notarizes and has witnessed the official deed of manumission of emancipation for Mary, Bell, and the six children. And you can see their names right here on the screen. And this is the, uh, this is the original deed of emancipation for Mary Bell and her ch their children. This is a joyous moment, right? Daniel Bell is still enslaved um, at the Navy Yard, but he appears to have negotiated for the freedom of his wife and his children. Two days later, Robert Armstead dies. Okay. His widow, Susan Armstead, begins what will become a, de a two decade effort to overturn this deed. Susan Armstead. The widow takes the position that this deed is invalid because Robert was out of his mind. 
in his dying days, that he was not of sound mind. She seeks to just overturn the will on those grounds, right? So what we have here, we're going to pause just for a second, is sort of freedom, a couple different kinds of freedom suits developing, right? We have um, different tracks of these lawsuits. One is Ashes and Ann Bell's stemming from the 1824 will, right? This is, this is a potentially a freedom suit based on the provisions of the will. Okay. Then we have a potential set, a second track of a freedom suit stemming from the Armstead deed. That, that the deed's good, the deed is uh, um, valid, and it can't be overturned. Um, and we have a third kind of track as well, maybe what Ann Bell will claim. That third track is living as a free person for more than 10 years was de facto freedom, okay, under the law. So in Maryland courts had pretty much decided that. So Ann Bell potentially from 1824 to what, 1834, 36, 35, 36, by 1836, if she has been living as a free woman for more than 10 years, she could file a freedom suit and claim for once and for all the court deter and the court might determine that she is free. Okay, so we have three different you know, pathways right here. Well, so after Daniel Bell negotiates the deed of manumission, this is what sets everything in motion, including James Ash's seizure in 1839 by uh, uh, Gerard T. Greenfield in his attempt to s suddenly sell him. So this is a whole family, and it's a little complicated, but let's get our, wrap our minds around it. Susan Armstead clearly is attempting to subvert the, the will. Uh, so subvert, sorry, the deed of manumission. And she is in touch with the Greenfields. And she essentially um, uh, tells them that Daniel Bell has been manipulating Robert Armstead, her, her, dead, her deceased husband, and uh, that Daniel Bell needs to be dealt with. And the first step that she takes in order to possibly make this deed of manumission, this deed of emancipation, um, uh, you, you, you know, un, unfounded, unsound, is to attempt to sell Daniel, get Daniel out of the picture. And so Daniel Bell is summarily sold by, we think, the Greenfields. I'm honestly not sure, but there seems to be a connection there. The minute the word gets out that Daniel has negotiated this deed of manumission, it comes full circle, and his slaveholder sells him in an attempt, as we've discussed, to get him out of Washington, D.C., separate him from Mary and the children, and then Susan Armstead will be able to deal with Mary and the children and, and keep them and subvert the, de the deed of manumission. Are everybody with me on that? Okay. So, uh, so this, is, this is a dramatic moment because in September of 1835, Daniel Bell is seized on the Navy Yard, on the floor. He's at the shop, at the blacksmith shop, and slave tr traders, th um, these aren't policemen. These aren't constables. These are hired thugs, right? They work for the slave trade. They work for William H. Williams, people like that. They, they, they rush the blacksmith shop. They're, we could imagine there are four or five of them, and they take down Daniel Bell, down to the ground, and they haul him off the floor, the shop floor. And he, it appears, is taken to the yellow house also. So in September of 1835, Daniel Bell is seized, and he's about to be sold. And so what does he do? Of course, he sues for his freedom. Now, his trial does not take place because there's a friend of his, a Marine colonel in, uh, in the, at the Navy Yard, that he seeks his help, and that Marine colonel buy, helps, helps Daniel Bell buy his freedom. 
So Daniel Bell negotiates for his freedom in that very moment, and he pays a th over $1,000. This is two years' wages, okay? Think about that today, in today's terms. Two years, full wages, to buy his freedom. Well, the Bell family recognizes that Susan Armstead is not going to let go. And she's already attempted to have Daniel Bell sold and separated, right? And at this moment, Daniel's sister, Ann Bell, files her petition for freedom. She sues Gerard Greenfield in Tennessee for her freedom, claiming that she'd been living as a free woman. He doesn't respond. The case goes on, summons after summonses. It just drags on for years. But here's what we need to know, right? Although Ann Bell had been living as a free woman with Lucy Bell, her mother, and, and, uh, and now Daniel Bell had bought, his, had bought his freedom, right? And presumably this deed with Mary and the children liberated them. The fact of the matter was that the Greenfields had been quietly bequeathing them to others all along between 1824 and 1836 over those 11 years from one generation to the next. So essentially, Ann Bell had been passed down on paper from one Greenfield to another. And the precariousness of Ann Bell's situation was that, well, she too could be seized like her brother and summarily sold, possibly, before she could get a freedom suit in, in play. But more particularly, so could her children, right? So could her children. The terms of that will were for her, not for her children. Gerard Greenfield possibly could attempt to sell the children. Now, word of Ann Bell's freedom suit spread quickly in the Greenfield family, and um, Susan Armstead, within a month of that, began trying to um, maneuver to overturn the deed of emancipation for Mary Bell. We have, we have Daniel and Mary Bell over here, and we have uh, Ann Bell suing Gerard Greenfield, right? And we have James Ash. Okay. Well, Susan Armstead bided her time, waited for the right opportunity to seize Mary and the children as, as property, as her property, and she drags out the probate for as long as she can on Robert's will. And she continues this whole time to, to hire out Mary and the children. She's hiring them out, and uh, Mary's claiming her freedom. Mary goes and gets a freedom certificate from the court based on the deed, It's probably the case that Mary Bell tried to negotiate with Susan Armstead, right? Probably. But Susan Armstead would not budge. Years go by. We're not sure of the timing or how it was coordinated, but in 1839, as Ann Bell's freedom suit against Gerard T. Greenfield has sort of stalled in the courts, Gerard T. Greenfield decides to sell James Ash. Sudden sale. If he can execute the sale, maybe he can get around the provisions in that 1824 will. And so in 1839, in December, just like Daniel Bell, James Ash is seized, taken to the Yellow House, and he's potentially uh, going to be sold south. So this is the lawsuit that Ash brings against William H. Williams. He's at the Yellow House, and he's being held there, and James Ash files his freedom suit against William H. Williams, and this is the case that will go to the Supreme Court, and Tawney's decision is a precursor for Dred Scott. So what does Ash argue 
And what does Williams argue? And what does Tawney decide? Ash argued that the will, the terms of the will had to be followed, right? Um, there was an old principle in, in, in law that the, 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 uh, the intent of the will needs to be carried out. And that was Ash's position. The intent of the will was that if he were sold, he should be free. And in Washington, D.C., in the jury trial, the jury agreed and awarded uh, Ash his freedom. A month later, Ann Bell wins her freedom suit. So now, James Ash has won his freedom suit on the basis of the will. And Ann Bell wins her freedom suit on the basis of having lived for 10 years as a free woman. She didn't even get to deal with the will. The will she was also involved in the will. But she made her case on, on having lived for 10 years as a free woman in Washington, D.C. In fact, the judges uh, 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 instructed the jury, think about this, Ann Bell had purchased property in the city. Okay, she'd bought property. She'd built a house. She'd made contracts. Tawny's decision in Dred Scott should be ringing in your head, right? Okay? She'd, she'd bought property in the city. She'd built a house. She'd made contracts. And unbelievably, she'd even hired a, a, an enslaved person from the Greenfields. So she had a contract with the Greenfields. So can an enslaved person make contracts? Can, can, so this is, uh, of course... Um, the issue, and the judges said that these acts are, quote, inconsistent with the condition of slavery. The Greenfields knew about this, did nothing in response, and so the jury could infer that Ann Bell was free. All right. So, James Ash has won his case. Williams appeals to the Supreme Court. But now, this case raises a, a vital question, doesn't it? It's now before the Supreme Court, and it comes to, it comes to uh, the court in 1843, and it raises this vital question of whether an enslaved person can receive a bequest of freedom through a will. If an enslaved person is property under the law, it would be hard to argue that they could. But if, in, if enslaved people are persons under the law, then possibly they could. It posed this fundamental question of whether slaves were property under the law or human beings, okay? Now, not surprisingly, the slave traders take the most unambiguous position possible. William H. Williams' argument is the following. Quote, Negroes by the laws of Maryland are property precisely as money in the funds or household effects. End quote. Okay. They even cite Queen V. Hepburn and John Marshall's decision suggesting that property should govern all of these matters. Right? And they say that Bequests of freedom, freeing an enslaved person through a will leads to a repugnant conclusion that enslaved people are something other than property. This is much the same logic that, um, that Roger Tawney would deploy in Dred Scott's case. What is Ash's argument? James Ash has a young attorney named Joseph Bradley who's anti-slavery uh, in, in, and abolitionist in leaning. He had defended uh, an abolitionist uh, editor, Reuben Crandall, in a, in a sort of very, very controversial trial, a uh, high-profile libel case in 1835 uh, in Washington. And Bradley makes the argument that enslaved people are uh, people, are human beings, of course. 
He positions this argument around human rights. And he too cites Queen V. Hepburn, but, he, but he, he points to the dissent that we talked about, right? He points to Duval's dissent that says, you know, courts and, should lean in favor of, of freedom, lean in favor of, 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 of uh, liberty. Bradley also, at trial, made the argument, and I quote, although they are personal property, yet they are also recognized as persons and are so-called in the Constitution of the United States and are capable of receiving a bequest of freedom. So Ash's argument that, through Bradley is tied to the constitutional uh, question here about ensla are enslaved people persons under the meaning of the Constitution? We've talked about that in this class. And what does that mean? Now, it may surprise you that Roger B. Tawney upheld Ash's freedom in this case in 1843. James Ash achieved a stunning victory, didn't he? His case is one of only a handful of freedom suits at the Supreme Court to be affirmed for freedom. And Tawney renders this opinion that is meant to, uh, uh, in his view, keep the property rights of slaveholders protected. Nevertheless, Ash achieves a stunning victory. I mean, after all, Ash takes on the Yellow House. He takes on William H. Williams. Um, uh, he wins his freedom at trial, and then it's upheld at the Supreme Court level. And uh, so why? So how? Well, Tawney's opinion says that Ash's freedom, and he says this without a hint of irony, right, took effect the moment he was sold. <laughs> the moment he's sold, he's free, which seems like a counterfactual, counter contradictory argument, right? But what is he really saying? Well, on the one hand, what Tawney does is he's recognizing that the property rights of slaveholders like himself and, and that he believed in pointed one way, and the principles of the intent of the will pointed another way, right? One is a public policy matter about the constitutional property rights and how they take effect in, uh, in, uh, across the United States. And the other is a private civil matter, but nonetheless extremely important in the law for how wills are, are uh, administered, right? Okay. He clearly wants to protect the property right concept of the slaveholding class. And he doesn't want to do anything that would affirm the idea that we just mentioned, that Ash uh, presented, that African Americans were rights bearing persons under the law and constitution. He wasn't going to do that. So what does he do? He creates a legal fiction, I think. And that is this, that there are three people involved in this will and bequest. Wrap your mind around this. There are three people. There's Maria Greenfield, the testator who, who writes the will, right? There's James Ash, the chattel, the enslaved property, who has no rights in Tawney's view, and who is, who is uh, simply a piece of property. So he actually accepts the argument that the slave traders' attorneys make, right? Right there. And there's James Ash in the same body, a latent free man. This sort of thinking, this sort of magic trick, in a way, um, evil magic trick, is, uh, is meant to 
um, meant to make it possible for Tawney to affirm the property rights, that the property rights were not violated here because Ash's freedom takes effect the moment he was sold because there are three people, three beings, if you will, in this, uh, in this transaction. So let me pause. Do we have any, any like, questions at the, at the moment? Yeah, yeah, Lauren. Um, what happened to Mary Bell and her children? OK, this is a great question. What happens to Mary Bell? So Ash is, has won his freedom, won it at the Supreme Court level. Ann Bell has won her freedom at the circuit court level. It's not appealed to the Supreme Court. So large parts of the Bell family are free, right? Uh, Lucy Bell has negotiated, the, the, the grandmother has negotiated for her freedom. Um, Mary Bell uh, and the children, there is the deed of manumission. Daniel Bell has, has negotiated for his freedom and bought his freedom. Mary Bell is still in this sort of inner, uh, this unclear uh, state. She ends up suing for her freedom in 1844 um, to try to clarify that, you know, she knows that Susan Armstead's trying to overturn the deed of manumission, and she sues for freedom in the court to try to clarify once and for all her freedom. Um, I mean, after all, she has a deed that's been signed and notarized and witnessed. She has a certificate of freedom from the court. She's taken the deed down to the court, received a certificate of freedom that says she's a free woman, and yet it's still murky. It's still not a sure thing, right? She, um, and so she sues for her freedom in, because, in part, she hears through the grapevine that Susan Armstead is about to try to sell one of her children. Okay? But... In 1847, in December, Mary Bell's lawsuit is unsuccessful. Um, Susan Armstead's able to win that case, and the jury finds that Robert Armstead was not of sound mind, and the deed is overturned. Now, at this moment, desperate, uh, Daniel Bell organizes an escape for Mary and the children. He helps bring to Washington, D.C. He writes a series of letters. He tries to get help from, from abolitionists. But he is the driving force. Daniel Bell is the driving force behind what becomes the largest uh, slave escape attempt in American history on the Pearl. Um, a ship, a vessel that Daniel Bell helps set in motion to bring from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. And in April of 1848, 77 enslaved people get on board the Pearl and the Pearl on a dark night sails out of Washington, D.C., down the Potomac River, 90 miles to Point Lookout, where it opens up into the Chesapeake Bay. And by that time, a steamer had caught up with the Pearl, and the vessel is boarded and captured, and all of the 77 enslaved people and the crew, a white crew from uh, Philadelphia, are taken back to Washington, D.C. The crew is, and the captain are put on trial, for leading a slave insurrection. And Mary and the children are, along with many others on board, are, are sold, essentially. Uh, here's, the, here's the list of the pearl. You can see uh, um, Mary here. Uh, Mrs. Armstead, there, there she is. Susan Armstead, right? And we see George Bell, Daniel Bell, Mary Bell with two children, Caroline with two children, 
Mary Ellen, Harriet, and then th this little scripple is uh, Navy Yard right here. They're all associated with Daniel Bell and the Navy Yard. Um, the slaveholders who's in, who, who uh, for, the people who, who tr attempted to escape, right, the slaveholders of those people um, really effectively wanted to uh, send a message to the enslaved across Washington, D.C. and Maryland that uh, uh, to teach the enslaved a lesson, not to run away, not to escape. And so um, they would be sold. They were sold south really as a deterrent. And Mary and most of the children were taken to Baltimore for sale to be sold. This is the scene we just saw in the, in the short film, that, right? They were taken from the B&O Railroad Station in Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. And so Daniel is desperate trying to uh, um, intervene, to intervene uh, uh, and, and possibly stop the sale of Mary and the children uh, south. Um, and at that moment, you know, Daniel on the, on the depot platform is, is sort of uh, bludgeoned by the train conductors and he's, he stopped, he's, the, the train pulls away. And um, some abolitionists saw this and um, helped Daniel intervene. And so what happens to Mary Bell in, and Daniel is that um, eventually with help from some abolitionists, local uh, abolitionists, Daniel Bell is able to raise $400 and he's able to purchase Mary Bell's freedom, but he only has enough money to purchase two of the children. Okay, so Daniel and Mary Bell have to decide which two children will be saved and kept and which uh, three or four children will be gone and sold. And um, they, they do that. Um, after the Civil War, some of the children are able to reunite with Mary and Daniel Bell. Um, but two, uh, two appear not to have, we, we don't know what happens to them, and I, we don't know. But they are sold, and they are taken away uh, at age 8, 9, 10. So... Mary Bell, Daniel, just like he purchased his own freedom, now essentially has to purchase Mary's freedom. So while Ann Bell wins her freedom in court and James Ash wins his freedom in court, this is what happens to Mary Bell. In fact, um, well, you can see how there, there's the, you know, there, there were 11 Bells. The largest family group on the Pearl were, were the Bell family. There were 11 of them, okay? And um, this is the court document valuing them for Susanna Armstead at, uh, at $5,000. One final comment on that. There is one final lawsuit that Eleonora Bell, Mary's daughter, brings against Susan Armstead um, uh, if, in 1850-51. And she, um, th just to be clear, She's eight years old, okay? So the last lawsuit is Eleonora Bell's, and she's eight years old, and she, she sues Susan Armstead, who's continuing to hold her as an enslaved person. She's the one who was not sent, uh, who was not sold south, okay? And Eleonora, Eleonora Bell, that suit, there are dozens of witnesses. It's a big big deal in Washington, D.C. in 1851, and um, the same result uh, the jury finds uh, for, Susanna Arms for Susan Armstead, on, uh, that Robert was not of sound mind, uh, and the, will, uh, the deed of manumission is, is not valid. And Eleonora Bell does not win, she is not liberated until the summer of 1862 uh, in the Civil War, right? Great, great question, yeah. Um, let's turn, finally, to the, to the, let's step back 
and as we wrap up here and think about the significance of freedom suits broadly as an avenue of, of anti-slavery constitutionalism, okay? So when we step back and we think about what we learned today, what the story of James Ash tells us and Daniel Bell and Ann Bell, so let's consider what are the sources of anti-slavery constitutionalism? Well, one source that scholars have looked at, one, one dimension of anti-slavery constitutionalism is the lawyers like Joseph Bradley. Okay? We, we talked briefly about his argument. Lawyers who, to be sure, helped enslaved families bring these cases and made arguments that were anti-slavery and clearly aimed at, at laying down a, a track of argument, right, that is that slavery is not guaranteed by the Constitution, is not, uh, that slavery is circumscribed, it's local, it's not national. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, 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 a one part of this is lawyers who make those arguments. There's no doubt about that. They are getting that anti-slavery constitutionalism in the record. A second area of anti-slavery constitutionalism is certainly the dissenting opinions, right? We mentioned Gabriel Duval's in Queen v. Hepburn. And we could also talk about John McLean's in uh, Dred Scott v. John Sanford. McLean's dissent is really a dissent like Duval's about f freedom and, the imp and that slavery is not in any way sanctioned in the Constitution. Okay. Um, Third, and this is so important, these are in gradual, uh, of gradual importance in my view. Um, third, black abolitionists. We talked about Frederick Douglass, right? And you've, and you've read Frederick Douglass, um, who in 1851 breaks with the Garrisonians and moves to the, to the position that the Constitution is a guarantee of liberty, is a, is a freedom document. And so Douglas becomes the voice of, one of the principal voices of anti-slavery constitutionalism. He is saying that blacks, of course, are citizens, are persons under the meaning of the Constitution. But fourth, and most important, given what we're talking about today, are the freedom suits, okay? The enslaved families themselves who brought these cases, most of all, laid down a series of arguments that the Constitution was not pro-slavery, that the Constitution uh, did, did not create a, a, a slavery-based uh, national system, but instead one on, uh, uh, based on freedom. And we think about James Ash, uh, Ann Bell, Mary Bell, Eleonora Bell. This long line of freedom suits arguing that freedom was national while slavery was local. Freedom was national while slavery was confined to certain places, certain contingencies, certain law, certain definition and conditions. And in Dred Scott's case, Chief Justice Roger Taney tries to displace that entire line of argument, right? Entirely. In his view, slavery is national. The property rights of slaveholders are national. And freedom is local or uh, confined. But slavery is ubiquitous in, in uh, Tawney's opinion, which you've read and know well. So in, in sum, these enslaved families who bring the freedom suits from 1800 uh, uh, or 1790s all the way up to 1860 articulate the longest, most sustained argument based around anti-slavery constitutionalism. And, uh, and so, um, so next, we'll see how the Civil War transformed this constitution and uh, um, thank you, and uh, see you next week. Enjoy.
your weekend. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.